And how many of our secrets do we hold on to that we say, I'll never tell anybody. Mm -hmm. I will take that to my grave. Right. If anybody out there listening have heard yourself say that, this is the step for you because this is the path to freedom. Has your marriage been shattered by sexual betrayal? Are you wondering if it's possible to save your marriage or even if you want to? Your story matters and there is hope for your marriage through Christ Jesus. Welcome to Beyond Broken Vows podcast. I'm Johnny. I'm Emily. And friends, we've been where you are. Our marriage vows were shattered by adultery fueled by pornography. But through a commitment to recovery, our faith in God, and our hope for redemption, we set out on a journey of healing. Now our marriage is better than we ever could have imagined, and we give God all the glory. On our show, we'll talk through difficult topics, infidelity, porn addiction, recovery, and more. So if you're ready to move from pain-filled todays into hope-filled tomorrows, Grab your favorite beverage and spend a little time with us. Marriage is redeemed. Hearts renewed. On Beyond Broken Vows podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Beyond Broken Vows podcast. Yes, it's so good to be back here again with you. Absolutely. So, Emily, we had the opportunity this past weekend to go into town and look at uh, a trail of lights and see a holiday parade. Yes, that was really fun. It's been a long time since we've done something like that, that small town Mm -hmm. kind of flavor. I grew up in a small town and I used to go to the parades all the time. But since we lived in the bigger city, we didn't really do many things associated with small town activities. Right. But um, now that we're living near a small town again, it's just kind of exciting to be able to do those things that are fun for kids, especially since we took all of our grandkids with us. It's fun to watch the Christmas activities through the eyes of our kids when they see the lights or they see the floats in the parade. But I think in some ways it also touches the kid and us again. Yeah, it does. It was pretty fun. I really enjoy just looking at all the lights and hearing the music and being with family. So I hope you guys have had some opportunities to enjoy the Christmas festivities around your area going to see Christmas lights or going to see shows. It's just part of that whole season of celebration. And I know it can be a difficult time of the year for a lot of people, but it's always good to step outside of yourself for just a moment and see what's going on in the world around you and connect in a different way than you had been. Emily, I couldn't agree more. Thank you. Before we get into our topic for today, we want to share a five-star review that we got from Sweet Melissa. She titled her review, Healing for Couples, and she says, Thank you for sharing your story as a couple. Recently, a friend confided in me that she went through betrayal, forgiveness, and restoration in her own marriage, and finding someone she could trust to help her through the process was difficult. This podcast will bring support, hope, and healing to many. Thank you, sweet Melissa, for that really wonderful review. It is very difficult sometimes to go through that without a friend to walk through it with you. And so we really encourage that if this is your situation, that you would find somebody to open up to. Yes. Okay, guys, I know you're tired of the dissatisfaction that comes with repeatedly viewing pornography, making promises to yourself and others that you're going to stop only to go back to the same destructive behavior that keeps you feeling empty, guilty, and full of shame. You're reading all the right books and Bible passages, hoping somehow these will make sense and offer direction on how to change your pattern of compulsive choices. You want to know from God how you can find freedom from your addictive sexual behavior and how to repair the damage done to your spouse and marriage, but don't know who to trust or where to start. I want you to stop looking around. I want you to stop being stuck in this cycle of poor choices. I'm going to help you find a new direction that will lead you to true freedom once and for all with God's help. With a few simple concepts and some measured steps, you can become the man of integrity that you started out to be, free from shame, free from guilt, standing on solid ground, feeling better than you have ever felt before. I want you to go right now to coaching.beyondbrokenvows.com and get started with me on your path to freedom. That's coaching.beyondbrokenvows.com. Are you in? Let's do this. So, Emily, last week we covered step four of sex addiction recovery, which states we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Yes, and I imagine that's probably one of the hardest things a person can do 
is to really take stock in themselves and look into themselves seriously and honestly. Absolutely. But now that we have our inventory, we are ready to talk about what we're going to do with this information. Okay, let's do that. So the Green Book says for step five, each step of the program is a leap of faith that moves us forward in our recovery. After completing our moral inventory, we are challenged in step five to take another leap. Now we need to admit the whole truth that we have discovered to God, to ourselves, and to another person. Working the fifth step helps relieve us of the burden of our secrets, break through our isolation, and face ourselves honestly in a way that we cannot do alone. With the fifth step, we come out into the open. As active sex addicts, we hid who we were and what we were doing from others, but also from ourselves. We take the fifth step when we come out of hiding, let go of self-deception, and acknowledge our reliance on a higher power. Our belief that we were isolated, estranged from the care of our loving God, kept us in fear. Now, breaking free of secrecy, we admit our wrongs in the light of our relationship with the God of our understanding. If we trust, we'll be given the power to acknowledge our shortcomings. Admitting our wrongs to God opens the door to change within ourselves. We have found that God will help us find the courage and honesty we need in order to work this step. Also in the fifth step, we reveal all our secrets to another person, many of us for the very first time. Despite our commitment to the program, we often find ourselves feeling afraid at this point. We may expect to be judged harshly and rejected if we tell someone our secrets, especially those acting out behaviors of which we are most ashamed. These fears are only natural, but we cannot allow them to prevent us from taking this step. We call on our higher power for strength and for the willingness to share our story. We discover that the person hearing our fifth step will not reject us, but will often respect us for our honesty and courage and love us all the more. We pick someone we trust to hear our inventory. Most of us share our fifth step with our sponsor. Some of us choose a friend in the program, a therapist, a spiritual advisor, or another wise confidant with whom we feel safe. It is best to take this step with the help of a person who has worked this step in his or her own recovery and who already knows and accepts us unconditionally. Wow, that's really thorough. I really like how the Green Book lays out each step so specifically. It's so very helpful. It is helpful. But uh, speaking of accepting us unconditionally, let's go talk to God who himself accepts us completely and utterly unconditionally. Yes. Father, thank you so much for bringing us to step five. For all the courageous steps that we've taken thus far to be here with you now, we depend on you to take this step. As we take this inventory of our behaviors and now speak them out to others while admitting them to ourselves and talking to you about them at the same time, we need your help. We need your courage and we need your guidance. So today, Father, as we talk through this portion of our recovery program, may you give us grace and mercy, and may your tenderness be with us as we work through this very difficult part and get ourselves ready to share this with another person. Thank you, Lord Jesus, and we ask all this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so step number five. Would you go ahead, Johnny, and reiterate again what that step is? Step five says, admit to God myself, and another human being, the exact nature of my wrongs. Okay, great. And you usually define something for us every week. What word are you going to define for us? Well, it's going to be the word admit, which is at the very beginning, and that is to confess to be true. Okay, good. Confess. Right. But if you want to take a step further, we can define the word confess, which says to own or to admit the truth. So they are synonymous with each other. We're going to be talking a lot about confession while we're also speaking about admitting in this step, because we're going to tie this into God's word at the end like we normally do. Okay, wonderful. We're going to be doing some confessing. Right. So who are we going to confess to? Emily, the first person that we admit our wrongs to is to God. Good place to start. It is, because that puts us into the care of our loving higher power. Remember, somebody who's greater than ourselves that can restore us to sanity. 
It also opens the door to change within ourselves. Then having spent that time with God, he gives us the courage to work this step. Yes, and I think that's a big part of the step, isn't it? Courage. Absolutely. And we're going to see in a minute why that is. Okay. So we confess to God. Right. And then who else? Next is ourselves. Mm. Remember, as I've said before, the first person that we lied to was ourself. Right. And the first person we hurt was ourself. Mm -hmm. And so this is where we have to start admitting to ourselves that we did these things. And when we look over our life and see what we've done, which we're going to outline here in just a moment, it starts to bring a clarity, a pattern of behaviors and reactions and reasons why we were doing what we were doing. Okay. So you have to confess to God, then you confess to yourself. Right. And then it's time to confess it all to others. Ooh, others. Yes. Who would that be? That's going to be somebody of your choice that is trusted. Now, in our program, we usually do this with our sponsor. Okay. I shared with my sponsor first, but in my specific group, we're actually encouraged to stand up in front of the entire group, and we share this step with everybody. Wow. That sounds a little intimidating. Well, it's actually terrifying. (laughs) to think about. And standing up in front of everybody, you say, everybody, is this the whole world? It's like, well, no, this is actually a group of recovering sex addicts who have been where you are. And they've all stood in that same spot at one point or another and given their inventory of behavioral misdeeds. So you're in good company there. That's true. The benefits of telling others is that you get to hear yourself say the words to somebody else. Why is that a benefit? Because sometimes you can have things going on inside your head and it sounds just fine there. But when you say it out loud, somehow it changes. Somehow it becomes more real. Even when you say it to God in prayer, or you're just saying it to yourself in your head, that's really just this unspoken conversation that's going on only in your mind. But when your mouth says it, it changes it. Our senior pastor encourages us to pray out loud, Mm -hmm. even when we're by ourselves, because the prayers change. It becomes more powerful, doesn't it? I agree. I think that that's exactly the point. So you get to hear yourself say the words to somebody else, and that brings some power. Also, it breaks the cycle of isolation. Yes, I can see that. If you're only saying those things inside your own head, you're still alone. Right. And how many of our secrets do we hold on to that we say, I'll never tell anybody. Mm -hmm. I will take that to my grave. Right. If anybody out there listening have heard yourself say that, this is the step for you because this is the path to freedom so that you don't have to carry those secrets anymore and live the pain anymore. And then you get the benefit of the love, acceptance, and the support of others who have been in the like situation. I have said before, that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it's connection. Yeah, when you first told me that, it was really eye-opening. I hadn't thought about it like that before. Okay, so that's who you're confessing to. So what are you confessing? All right, folks, buckle up because here it is. What we are confessing is a complete inventory of all our past behaviors and actions where we harmed ourselves or someone else. All past behaviors, like from the time you were a kid, everything bad that you ever, ever did? Well, it's hard really to get everything down, and some things are just not helpful. But really, you're to go back as far as you can remember where you were involved with your addiction. Like for me, it was when I first got exposed to pornography. So mine started back with my family of origin around the time that I was eight years old. Mm -hmm. And that's how far back I went. Okay. But you're not disclosing every single detail of your entire life. It's really just what relates to your addiction? That's right. Okay. Yeah. It does relate to our addiction and how we hurt ourselves and somebody else through that. Okay. Makes sense. Right. And at this point, it's really helpful to write it all down. This is in some ways a dubious autobiography. (laughs) Right. Because these are things that you told yourself you would never tell anybody else. 
And now you're looking at the prospect of not only telling somebody else, but now writing it down where there's a written record. These are very uncomfortable steps, but they are necessary, courageous steps to take so that you can come out of isolation and into the open. Yeah. And Johnny, what did you do with that written confession after you had made it? (laughs) So let me just back up for a moment and say that it took me several weeks to write mine out, my inventory of behaviors as it related to how I hurt myself and others. It took several weeks and 50 pages front and back. Oh my goodness. That's a lot of words. Right. But it was a long life. I was trapped in my addictive cycle for 40 years. Mm -hmm. Now, some won't be trapped that long and won't have as much to put in there. Others, maybe even longer. Mm -hmm. But I was challenged by my sponsor to be thorough, to not leave anything out. And then together, we would work out some of the things that maybe didn't need to be there. Okay. So that 50 pages was there. Now that I have my inventory in hand, I've written it out and I've now shared it with my sponsor. He helped me call out a few things that were unnecessary, any shameful talk where I'm hurting myself again by speaking shamefully of myself. He helped me rewrite those or even omit them altogether because they're not helping me move forward, which is what this whole thing is about. We don't regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it, but we also don't want to dwell in such a place where it continues to hurt us. Uh huh. Good. So the very next thing that I did is I set a date where I stood up in front of everybody and I shared this step in open group. And it took me probably, I don't know, 40, 45 minutes to read through all of those pages. And then the group had an opportunity to uh, respond after that. And it was full of, the responses were full of love, acceptance, understanding. It felt so good to know that I wasn't alone. It felt so good that I didn't have secrets anymore. Mm. Once I read that out loud, there were no more secrets in my head. That sounds amazing. And I can see, Johnny, how that is just really touching you to talk about it even now, five years later. Yes, it's... It's such a powerful moment and such a powerful action that I hope that the emotion I feel now, I will feel for the rest of my life. It felt so good to be free of the secrets. I don't have any more. I'll take this to the grave. I don't have any of those. That is so wonderful. So now that I've had a chance to compose myself, Emily, I want to say that doing step five is connecting the defects that we recorded in step four, our list of character defects, to the actions that we've listed out now in that behavioral inventory. And we're going to tie those together and find out where our character defects were acting in those moments when we were doing those things where we were hurting ourselves or somebody else. Okay, that makes sense. You're acting out behaviors were an expression of those character defects that you had outlined in the last episode. Yes, that's a great way to say it. So in this process, we want to ask ourselves these four questions. Number one is, what did I do? That's pretty self-explanatory. Number two is, who did I hurt? Name that person specifically. Sometimes that person is you. But then if it's somebody else, you name that person. It's always best when we assign humanity to the people that we have hurt. It helps us feel the pain that we have inflicted through our behaviors. Number three is, how did it affect me? For example, uh, self-esteem. Did my actions affect my self-esteem? Did my actions affect my personal relationships? Did my actions affect me materially? Did it cost me money? More money than I thought it was going to, or did I get out of control with it? Did my actions affect me emotionally? Did my actions affect me sexually? Did my actions affect me socially? Because now I'm hiding in shame and I don't want to tell people these things that I do, I'm going to become somewhat socially awkward unless I'm covering it up with some character defects. And did my behaviors affect my security? Did it put me in jeopardy? 
do my behaviors make me feel insecure? Oh, and also with security, maybe an addict can get into legal troubles, not have control physically of his or her life anymore. That's correct. And number four is where was I wrong? This is admitting the exact nature of our wrongs as outlined in the statement of the fifth step. Told God, myself, and another human being the exact nature of my wrongs. So you ask yourself, when I did this, was I selfish? Was I dishonest? Was I self-seeking? Was I frightened or inconsiderate? These are all important things to get down to so that we can understand exactly what our actions were doing. I came to understand that between my uh, acting out behaviors and my resentments, everything came down to a fear. I was afraid of something. And that fear expressed itself outward through selfishness. When I went to go grab things for myself and not needing anybody else or getting what I wanted, regardless of what it did to myself or somebody else, or I was being dishonest, I was not being truthful with myself or with others, I was being self-seeking because I want this because I want this, or I was frightened, I was responding out of fear. What are some reasons you might have been frightened, honey? The biggest one for me is being out of control of a situation. When I feel that I'm not in control of any given situation, I get afraid. And that fear starts to come out in many ways. Internally, it can feel like like anxiety. I start to feel pressure on the inside and I can't focus. My eyes get tunnel vision and I can't see out the side of my eyes and my head. You know, I start having these feelings of anxiety and my chest gets tight and when I'm not in control. But this is all stuff that's going on in the inside. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows this. I can cover it up because I taught myself how to. I just decided that the entire world was such a fearful place that, as I've said in some earlier episodes, I created a false persona of a very gregarious personality, the life of the party guy, where nobody thought that I was acting in fear Johnny's happy-go-lucky and he's having a good time, when actually most of the time when I was acting outwardly that way, I was afraid of something somehow, and that's how I combated it. So that completes the who I'm confessing to and what I'm confessing. But as we talked about in the last episode when we talked about step four, we've got to remember that no inventory is complete unless we see the whole picture. And it's very important for us to remember all the good things that we did. I was sharing my inventory of acting out behaviors. And when I was done sharing that portion, my sponsor had encouraged me to put onto the very end of that what my life has been like since I started recovery and how far I've come. That sounds good because after saying all those horrible things about yourself, you could easily spiral into some sort of depression. Absolutely. And it does happen. I have seen some find an extreme amount of freedom that come from getting all of this off of their chest, including me. But I have heard and talked to others that it sent them into a depression and they unfortunately went and acted out right away afterwards because the pressure was just tremendous. The thing to remember in this is that you just made a huge step in your progress toward freedom. It did not completely set you free. You're still working through all of these defects of character and you're getting it all out of you. And sometimes it it will work against you. So we highly encourage those who have just given this step to be very gentle with themselves, to go and do something that makes them happy, to take care of themselves, go read a book, go for a hike, whatever it is that you like to do. If you like to tinker in your shop or go drive a car on a road trip, go do something to take care of yourself because you have done possibly the hardest thing you've ever done in your life. And so now it's easy to understand when you go back to the beginning, when we tell God ourselves and another human being, why it starts with God. Yes, because if you don't have that connection with God, you will possibly feel very alone again. We can get courage from watching our other fellows walk this step ahead of us. Mm -hmm. But God is ultimately the one who gives us the courage to take that step and how to do it and why to do it. So, Johnny, you 
still haven't answered my question from earlier. Oh, what have I missed? I asked you what you did with that list that you wrote out after you had recited it to the group. What did you actually do with your inventory list? Did you burn it? Did you crumple it up? Did you keep it? What did you do? Well, I I burned it in the fireplace. (laughs) Okay. So there was no chance of anybody stumbling across that. Yes. So here's the word. Today we have two verses that I want to share. The first one is 1 John 1, 9 out of the ESV. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The second is James 5, 16 out of NIV. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Yes, those are two really great verses, good enough to commit to memory. Absolutely. And so what's the hope, Johnny? The hope is, as we see in the Word, that if we confess our sins to God, He is faithful to forgive us. If we confess our sins to another, then they have the opportunity to walk with us and support us and pray for us so that we can be healed. Mm -hmm. And it reminds us that the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. So it tells us there that we need to pick good friends. (laughs) Yes, very important. Yes. And by doing all those things, it brings you to a place where you can come out of isolation to find love, acceptance, and support. So Emily, that is step five. It's a big step and there's a lot to it. And it's a very courageous step. Yes. We're grateful for the time that we had to talk about it today. Would you uh, close this portion out in prayer for us? Yes, I will. Heavenly Father, this is a big step. Wow, I can't even imagine having to do this myself, even though we probably all should be doing this on a regular basis, confessing our sins to each other and to you, first admitting to ourselves that we even have done something to fall short. So, Father, I just pray that you would help those who are going through this step right now or those who will be going through it in the future, that you would give them the strength and the courage that they need to be thorough and fearless as they go through it. Because, God, it is a scary thing, but nothing worthwhile is ever easy. And once we get through something like this, the other side is amazing. We just can't even imagine it when we're on the forefront of it. But when we walk through it, say goodbye, and then look forward, it's so bright. The future is so bright. Freedom feels so good. And so we thank you that you allow us a path to freedom through your word, through programs like Sex Addicts Anonymous, and through the prayers and help of others. Thank you for all of these things, and be with every one of us as we walk out the truths of Scripture in our daily lives. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Emily. So as we recap this, in step five, we confess to God, ourselves, and to others. We confess to them what we did, how we hurt others, how it affected us, and how exactly we were wrong. That sounds pretty simple, but it's not easy. Emily, that's so true. And like you said when you were praying, The best things that we do are not easy and often very, very hard, but they're worth it when we do them. Mm -hmm. So in our show notes, we have a link to a questionnaire that will help you determine for yourself whether you're a sex addict. We encourage you, if you feel that it's possible that you might be a sex addict, take this questionnaire. It's a very thorough, it goes quite quickly, and you will know whether you need to talk with somebody else or not. Sounds great. Also, if you're currently involved in Sex Addicts Anonymous, keep in contact with your sponsor. If you're not currently engaged in a recovery program and you need some help moving forward, book a coaching call with me at coaching.beyondbrokenvows.com and I can help you get started. And wives, if you need some support while your husband is going through a recovery program and you don't have anyone else to speak with, go ahead and book a call with me as well. That's coaching.beyondbrokenvows.com. So, Emily, when we finish step five, we feel as though a great burden has been lifted from our shoulders. Many of us feel a sense of wholeness and integrity for the very first time. The acceptance that we receive can be a profound spiritual experience. That is so hopeful. 
I'm so glad to hear that. And after taking this step, we're now ready to move on to step six, which we will get back to just after the beginning of the year. Okay, great. But what's coming up next week? Next week is going to be our Christmas special. Oh, yay. (laughs) We're going to lighten it up a little bit, and we're going to spend some time talking about the birth of our Savior. Awesome. That's what it's all about. Amen. So until next time. Marriage is redeemed. Hearts renewed on Beyond Broken Vows podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. And before you go, if this podcast encouraged you and you're feeling some hope for today, please share this show with someone else you know who is going through a similar situation and needs to know they're not alone. One of the best ways you can help us reach more people is to leave us a five-star written review on Apple Podcasts. And don't forget to hit subscribe so you don't miss out on upcoming episodes. And as always, we would love to hear from you with questions and comments. Just email us at support at beyondbrokenvows.com. As you walk out this journey one day at a time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Peace.